Hello, Oscar. Hello. Maybe for the beginning, you can a little bit talk about your background. Where do you come from? And yeah, what did bring you to jewelry in general? And you can start from more earlier memories also, so we can understand yeah. what kind of also brought you to art world and and so on. Yeah. Uh, the I think the thing the problem is that my parents met at the art school in Halle. They both studied art there. Uh, my mother jewelry and uh, my mother uh, my father painting, and um, so well I I grew up uh, with a lot of art friends around, and like a lot of of painters and jewelry makers. And uh, after school, um, then uh, we were going to to. Like, like a place where children be a little bit longer until the parents have finished their work. And uh, after this, uh, then I and my brother, we were going uh, to pick up my mother from, uh, from the art school. And uh, so, so I come in contact with this field quite, uh, quite early. And uh, then when my mother had to work a little bit longer, uh, I was allowed to form tiny figures from wax. And then there, every year was a casting in bronze. And uh, then one time I remember they casted all these tiny figures. And um, also then my mother cut them off. And uh, then uh, the, the gallerist of my father was interested in three of the figures. And uh, I got uh, 150 mark for them. So I was immediately rich. And uh, yeah, <laughs> so. Um, and then, then later, uh, I tried to study engineering, but it was not creative at all. And I thought it would also be uh, more creative that you design machines and that you are thinking how they are working and stuff. And but but it was more about uh, theoretical mathematics, um, and and. It was not my case, and then I, I, I said, said, okay, I stop this here, and uh, I think I want to make jewelry, because uh, the the craft itself is very cool, uh, the tools are amazing, and uh, if you produce the stuff, um, like you can put the amount of work that what you have done in a year in your backpack, and uh, then go where, uh, somewhere. Like like I uh, did here that I come uh, here for the exhibition, uh, I was able to to bring it in my hand luggage in the airplane. Yeah. What kind of jewelry surrounded you when you were a child and still developing? Yeah, of course, uh, the jewelry of my mother Andrea Wippermann was there around, and uh, the the jewelry of her professor Dorothea Prue. Um, these these uh, amazing pieces from wood were also very interesting, um, but then then also uh, I have seen pieces from Sabine Müller who also studied in Halle. Most people who want to do jewelry are not selecting art jewelry as their first career path because usually people imagine more goldsmithing when mm -hmm. you talk about jewelry. Um, yeah, for this exhibition, I brought um, I brought my art jewelry to say so, um, but I'm also working in silver, and uh, I bought a casting machine, and uh, now I really want to produce in silver, and also um, to produce rings with uh, stones that have the same same diameter, and so that I have when I have uh, twelve stones that are more or less the same size that I can produce 12 rings and also to then to sell them to to lower prices what I, then I hope that are are available to more to the common people um, because also a, a problem with the art jewelry is that you put a lot of working time in the pieces and then they become more expensive and um, if you're doing this too much, then then uh, no normal piece people can can buy them anymore, and that's also a pity. Um, and I I really try out to make them faster, but mostly it does not work out.
Isn't it a little bit controversial that you're making silver jewelry so it so that you would have something cheaper to sell uh, instead of uh, jewelry which you make out of bone and which is super expensive and people cannot <laughs> afford it? <laughs> Shouldn't it go a little bit other ways around or, <laughs> or how yeah. do you see it yourself? Mm. Yeah, that's funny part. <laughs> but um... <laughs> yeah, with bone, with bone, it's uh, yeah, bone was always there and was like next to the bonfire to say so, left over from the meals. And um, but I think it's really the working time. So like like if you're doing something from bone, uh, you you work with a unique piece of bone like the, the thickness is always different and uh, also the shape of the bone is different and um, then you do not know if it does crack or not so like if you if you assemble a piece it's extremely hard to copy it in the same way and therefore working with silver is uh, to say so much easier because like if you have a, a solid form uh, you can copy it in silicon and then uh, melt it out, out with wax and casting the wax. Uh, so somehow this, this expensive uh, silver, it's easier to work with. And I think mostly the price is coming from uh, the working time nowadays. And, and uh, so yes, the, the cheap bone is more expensive than the expensive silver, what is cheap. One moment, uh, another artist will change your exhibition yeah. uh, after a few months so maybe you can a little bit describe what kind of pieces are you showing here what they're made of and uh, what they represent because when you wrote your artistic statement then you were much more describing the technical process of the pieces than more philosophical background so maybe you can describe what kind of jewelry those people can see who pass the window in next few months. Yeah, uh, the, the main material of every piece uh, is bone, I think except for one. Uh, and these are cut off uh, pieces from, from uh, bones from the cow from uh, this part here, from the, uh, from the leg. Um, and I was working on them with files and uh, drilling them and uh, uh, flatten the, the, the surface with files. Uh, and then um, I had a lot, lot of these pieces and uh, I was arranging them like what is fitting together with what, uh, with, with what other part. Um, and to connect them I used silk, silk and other textiles. Um, yeah, the philosophical background. Somehow this is uh, complicated because it's quite playful to, to make them. And um, it's not that I really work to a certain topic. It's uh, more the curiosity about the material and uh, how to combine them and how, uh, how the colors work with one each other and uh, the surfaces, yeah. When you use so natural um, material, the shapes that you carve or file, they're very technical. They rather mm, somehow remind me Anton Tsepka or Peter Skubic or someone who works with uh, constructivism mm -hmm. and yeah, it's not very natural shape. Also, when we think about uh, Dorothea Brühl, who you mentioned, then mm. usually she, even when she works with natural materials, she still keeps natural shapes. It's very, how to say, amorphous or very like uh, some kind of fabric in the wind. But your jewelry is more technical. It looks like uh, your something from your engineering background. <laughs> yeah, um, like like uh, I during my study I found a, a very nice book about uh, fishing hooks from the Pacific, 
and uh, the, the book was awesome because they were making these fishing hooks and also the reflectors that is reflecting the light from, from shells and uh, there was no steel in it and before uh, when I thought uh, fishing hook steel of course because it's quite simple and stable uh, but they used all uh, kind of natural materials woods and um, um, and bone for example and a lot a lot of um, textiles and um, uh, uh, the, the, the surface of the tree how is it called that uh, you can make strings from it I don't remember the word and so they, they uh, were um, combining all, all these different kinds of material to, to one fishing hook that uh, also was uh, stable enough for, for the purpose to catch the fish. And they are super beautiful. And um, the, the combining te te uh, techniques with the textile are very accurate and um, that, that was uh, very inspiring and uh, before I had already worked with bone and uh, bone is very stable you can you can drop it and it will not break immediately and um, it's it's flexible like if you have a, a long form like this you can bind it a little bit uh, and also you can drill it very well and then I thought okay when I have this material and these options um, I, I can combine this to something bigger. Have you got any feedback from vegans? From whom? From vegans. Ah, from the, ah, no. because I made once yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, an exhibition yeah. uh, where I had all the pieces made out of one wild boar or the bones of a wild boar, and I got quite a lot of uh, mm, how to say aggressive uh, messages in Facebook and in media because <laughs> it was seen as something very cruel that art is made out of uh, suffer of other animals because I used yeah a wild boar who was shot yeah. by a hunter yeah uh, I, I think the hunter shot the white boar because of the meat and uh, so normally the rest of the wild boar goes to the trash or like to the forest again uh, so it's kind of recycling to say so uh, and I did not uh, get any negative uh, input because of this material but I'm also not on Facebook and uh, not so in the social media um, like I have been to different fairs in Munich uh, and in Pforzheim at one and um, the, the people were curious about the material but um, they, they never said I'm an evil cow killer or something. Yeah, on the other hand, like if you work with silver, also like to put the silver out of the ground, uh, that there, there you can uh, destroy the environment very much. And uh, for for the gold, it's the same that uh, gold uh, can can be found in regions where where you have civil wars, and uh, so so then the the, the, the forces there sometimes have their own gold mines and financing their weapons with it. So I don't know what is better to work with bone or to, to with precious metal. Um, yeah, some, some people uh, work only with uh, fair trade gold anymore. And I think that's also an option if you can really be sure that it's from there. But like um, with the normal gold, you cannot say where it comes from. Like, uh, it can, can be that you have a, a wedding ring from gold and there are pieces uh, from old Greece and uh, from the Maya and Inca and Aztecs and also from the old Viking dudes. Uh, you don't know where, do, you do not know where, where it comes from really, yeah. How your process looks like? How do you get your material? What do you do with it? Uh, do you eat all the meat yourself? and then use the rest of it for art or how does it look like what happens in your studio yeah no i'm i'm not hunting for cows um the the first bones i i got at 
as a gift from from an old goldsmith lady, and uh, she was cooking the bones out by herself. Um, but the bones you can buy for this are normally like this length, and. I found uh, a factory that is making the, the thieves for the piano and the inlays for the for, for um, these uh, instruments um, from bone. And I think uh, long time ago they were made this from ivory, but now they use uh, bone from the cow only. And so they really have an eye on it that the, the bone is not cut it too short and then the max maximum length is, is like this roundabout. And then they cook out one ton, like at at one time, and also uh, put uh, chlor on it that does not smell so much anymore. Uh, and and um, then I was buying buying ten pieces for for one hundred euro. So the material is quite cheap. Yeah. Yeah, because there's a lot of different bones that you can can buy. I'm not meaning the black market where you can. Get the ivory, uh, ivory or or uh, rhino yeah. the horns, but you can also very legally buy giraffe bones, which are quite large pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, you can buy them from uh, knife factories who make fancy hunting knives or stuff. So, yeah. have you tried different bones, or you somehow stay loyal for cows? Yeah, I did not know that it's uh, legal to buy giraffe bones uh, because I thought like there are not enough left or something. <laughs> uh, and and cows, I think we have enough on the planet. Yeah, you can even buy mammoth. Yeah, but this cannot die out anymore. Because <laughs> mm. if I work with bone, it's it's uh, yeah, it's uh, something in between wood and stone. For me it's the most perfect material for carving mm -hmm. because um, wood is very charismatic. It doesn't want to do what you want wood to do. And stone is also very charismatic. It wants to break very yeah. fast. <laughs> Bone is strong enough. It's stronger than wood and in the same time it's so much softer than stone, that it's very comfortable to work yeah. with it. Yeah, like with bone, uh, it has really the, um, this thing that it has a, a purpose in, in the body and is holding the muscles and all the other stuff. And uh, if you see a cow, how heavy it is, uh, like this, these bones have to hold together the whole cow. Like without them, it would be, uh, and and. Uh, the, this this is something very strong for the jewelry and for the for for the mechanic uh, part to say so like it, it really does not break and um, I I was working with the bone in uh, Ida Oberstein and there a lot of people are working with stone because we have very good uh, stone workshops there yeah it's the mecca of stone basically yeah, it is uh, and but. Like when it does fall down, it's <laughs> or even if uh, if you grind it and then in the very structure of the stone is something a tiny crack, then it can can crack the whole thing apart, and then you have to glue it. Uh, and yeah, with with the with the bone, it's not that complicated. Also, like when I was. Um, when I was seeing the pieces and when I was experiencing how they are were, were worn, uh, then I was seeing that like if you have this this stone piece, uh, you cannot make the same movement uh, like with a piece from bone. Like with a piece from bone, you really don't have to take care so much. You can like da 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 da. If you do this with a stone piece of the same size. Uh, Maybe it will break immediately, and uh, so then. Therefore, I would say, like to wear a piece from bone is more fun than from stone. It's always very funny to go to Schmuck and to watch old collecting ladies who like to wear big 
piece of jewelry and yeah. then they try to hug each other but it's very hard because uh, the yeah. pieces of jewelry are very expensive and very fragile so they kind of try to rub their I don't know sides together <laughs> because yeah. they cannot you know, confront each other <laughs> <laughs> because they both have two valuable pieces around their yeah. neck but with uh, with uh, bone, I think it's a little bit different. Yeah, like um, during uh, I, I was making a lot of the pieces for my thesis work in Ida Oberstein, and uh, and then in in the beginning of, uh, of the year, uh, we we normally uh, like my uh, a group of friends and I we go for a kayak trip. So I took um, my pieces with me in a in a pre form to say so. The textile was not um, was not the final thing, but I was arranging it, and uh, then I had I think four or five pieces with me, and I was wearing them every day uh, to to see uh, if if this works out with the rain and uh, with the sun, and uh, also with the movement in the kayaking boat, and uh, it works out. Yeah, and uh, none of the pieces get lost. <laughs> How did you find your handwriting? How did you understood that... Um, how did you recognize that something suits you and something doesn't suit you? Bone suits you and stone doesn't suit you. Uh, jewelry suits you and maybe painting... I don't know if you, if you do painting, then painting doesn't work for you. I was I was working with the stone in Ida Oberstein, and uh, I've, I've, there there's a tiny river nearby where you can find stones that are not very hard, so you can work with them very fast. So then uh, I was making a lot of forms, like not thinking, just uh, grinding, uh, and then I had all these forms, and it was like, oh my god, in the stone every form is in. Like, you can do really everything. And I thought, oh, no, that's too much. <laughs> um, and uh, also, also, it's um, stone is, is much heavier than bone. Um, so then I were, that was important for me to go uh, to the bone be, because uh, the maximal thickness is only just like this. And... Um, so, like, you are more handicapped to say so, but uh, there, um, when you cut some something off, um, you see more easily where the journey can go to say so. Um, it's interesting that most people I happen to talk here don't do any sketches. They straight mm. start working in material. Some people don't do any sketches for their pieces, but they are doing a lot of photographs of, I don't know, birds and drawing uh, three branches and make some kind of fast uh, sketches of people in the metro station. And then mm. they go to their studio and start working on their pieces that are not related absolutely at all to their uh, experiences in the metro. How do you put all those things together? How do you gather your ideas? How those mechanical parts come to life? How they come together that one and another piece will get connected with a silk cord? Where do those decisions come from? <laughs> yeah. Um, to, to say so, um, uh, when I work with the bone, I, I cut off um, pieces of different size, and uh, then I, I'm with the file. I make flat surfaces, and uh, because of the shape, you cannot really connect that f these flat surfaces uh, proper. So, like, then you have to decide from where to where the flat surface will go, and and sometimes it does not work out. So. Uh, you cannot really make sketches before. You can make roundabout. Uh, can think how it shall look like. 
more or less but but if you want to make an exact uh, sketch it will not work out um, so like if you if you just uh, start and not think too much you come to better results and then with the drills in it I uh, by some pieces I just look where they look good and uh, like I think then here something is missing there's not enough so then I drill three holes and that's much better yeah and with this uh, drilling holes that, that comes from one uh, silver ring I was making once and uh, my mother and I we were trying out a new casting machine from from a dentist an old one from a dentist like to to make this very tiny things for the gold teeth uh, so like then you have a rotating arm in it and um, we had not no experience with the machine at all so we were casting and then this this ring had a lot of bubbles in it and holes and then uh, later in the studio I was looking at the ring and thought like I, I cannot fix this hole I can just make it round <laughs> so then I was uh, drilling this part uh, with round holes and then the, the the strange casting hole disappeared and I had a nice round hole in it and uh, also it looks looked much better than before so and I thought like oh this this I can do now every time I want uh, on stones on bones uh, with silver yeah yeah your pieces are usually having natural colors the way how they come out from from the cow maybe they're a little bit bleached but yeah. you haven't uh, added any blue or red dye, only color usually is the cord that you use in your pendants. Yeah. Uh, why haven't you wanted to use any color? There's a long history of coloring yeah. bones. Yeah, maybe I will do in the future, I don't know. But uh, until now I have to say that I like the, the natural color very much. Uh, also uh, here from this this iron wood uh, and the the color that comes with the silk and the other textile uh, for me it's enough I think when it would be too colorful uh, it would be disturbed the form to say so um, and also another um, uh, influence is is the the tools and the artwork from from the uh, Inuit people and uh, as far as I know they do also not color so much like uh, there it fits better you have the white bone in the white snow um, but, but it looks extremely cool I think but you mentioned the Inuit people um, are there any other mediums that influence you. Uh, some people say that they're very connected to film, uh, that they get a lot of ideas when they just see a lot of films. Some people mention more painting, some people who are usually using monochromatic tones, they usually mention printmaking because this is black and white usually. Yeah. What kind of uh, other mediums you're connected to? Have you tried any other things also? Or you have been keeping to jewelry all the time? Um, I think most of the time it was jewelry. jewelry. Sometimes object when it was too big to wear, to say so. Um, and um, I really like to go to, uh, to, to archaeology museums. Uh, we have a very wonderful in my hometown Halle um, where they have uh, these stone axes from from Stone Age and uh, normally in, in more small museums you maybe see three or five of them uh, but they were collecting all of them they had and so they were I don't know maybe 500 they put 500 on a wall from different stone material some with a hole, some without a hole, uh, bigger and smaller ones. And this is uh, really amazing with this, this natural material, the natural color, and but then uh, flattened by hand. 
and a lot of them drilled and then you also can see um, how they how they were working with it like there's one um, that was uh, breaking on the hole so they had only the one part but then it was still big enough so they just uh, drilled another hole in it so that they had a, a smaller X but it was still working and they had not to start from zero or um, then then other people of this time they had had a big stone and it was already a good form so so somehow they managed to to cut it in in two halves i think with uh sun sand and wood and then and water um and then they drilled it um and this this also um then i was trying to copy in Ida oberstein with stone but uh it's uh, it's quite complicated even if you have very modern machines it's not so easy yeah and also in this museum uh, you have a lot of uh, work from the bronze age like uh, swords and uh, shields uh, but also axe heads and um, these uh, plates for cutting corn and they are also um, the, the shape of them are very nice always um, that you can can see that the people were very uh, investing their time very well to to make them to make them work and very expressive uh, and that you had um, that you had really something with it yeah yeah I think it was uh, it was Einstein who said that he don't know how they fight in third world war, mm -hmm. but he knows how they will fight in fourth. Yeah, with, uh, uh, with, with sticks and with, stones. Yeah, <laughs> for people who don't see your exhibition because they are not in Tallinn, um, for them we can say that uh, your exhibition is facing Russian embassy, and it's kind of <laughs> the hotline of. Uh, of Eastern European <laughs> politics, where yeah. you are exhibiting your pieces, so you are facing with the Stone Age <laughs> jewelry that would represent the Fourth <laughs> uh, World War, maybe. <laughs> or does it mean something to you that you are in such epicenter that you are surrounded with protest banners and people protesting and and so on? I find this uh, very interesting, uh, but uh, the most of the people uh, I, I did uh, before the Russian went crazy, and uh, the the concept for the for for the, uh, how to present them here I I was developing before I ca came here, and uh, there I was not aware that the the Russian embassy is on the other side of the street and. I think to today I hear it against uh, the the people protesting here with making a lot of noise, and um, th this is very interesting place here, uh, but but uh, somehow also is a little bit scary. But what are your plans for the future? Yeah, I think in in the next time uh, I have to find out how my casting machine works, and. Uh, then when I have managed this, maybe I go back and bone. Um, maybe not. Uh, I'm not sure. And uh, then in, in February is uh, in Argenta in Munich again. Uh, there I will be. Yeah. And then I will see uh, what's next. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not easy to make very long plans. Yeah. In these times. <laughs> Yeah, also um, I, I, I noticed uh, that, that I, I mean, even, even before Corona and uh, before this strange war, it was not so easy to sell pieces. And now it's even harder. Uh, so I thought maybe now it's a better time to produce things and then hope that it get uh, better in the future. And then maybe I have time to sell it. Uh, <laughs> So, um, yeah, let's see um, what happens next. Yeah, the, this um, 
in in the in the last day of the old year uh, we have been to to a supermarket and there was um, the firefighters and they do this every year that they stay there around with some sparkling wine and uh, happy new year and they um, I think they never uh, say take care and stuff it, it comes immediately if you see them uh, and uh, the the, the, the boss of them, they said, that then, okay, and then hope hope the best for the new year. It can only get better. And we said, ooh, <laughs> last year we said the same. And, and uh, you know what happened, yeah? <laughs> um, I, I hope we will not be uh, surprised in a bad way. Uh, because in the moment it's extremely strange, the situation. But it always can get worse. Like that, I think when last year was telling us something than this. Yeah, but uh, let's hope for the best.